Hey guys, Brian Schultz here with Cape Falcon Kayak, and I'm here in the studio today with our first solo skin-on-frame canoe build of 2021 here. And just like in all my videos, I'm gonna talk about what I like about this latest boat, what I don't like about it, and then I'm gonna contrast it against the canoes that we built last year so we can talk about where the designs are gonna be heading next. Now, we also just got a brand new drone, so I'm gonna be interspersing this with some really cool aerial footage and ground footage as well hopefully just to make things a little bit more interesting while you listen to me talk. So anyways, quick bit of background, just in case you're new here and you don't know what this is all about. Once again, my name is Brian Schultz. I have been a full-time skin-on-frame boat builder and boat building teacher for 20 years. I have a website called capefalconkayaks.com where I sell skin-on-frame video courses, plan sets, and there's a whole bunch of free resources there as well. And for most of my career, I've been a skin-on-frame kayak builder, but about four years ago, a friend of mine convinced me to try to build a skin on frame canoe. And I decided to approach it differently than how people had done in the past. Instead of starting with a canoe mold that is time consuming and difficult to make, I decided to start with a set of mortised and laminated gunnels, more like a skin on frame kayak, and see if I could come up with a formula based system to determine the rib lengths. And I wasn't sure if this was gonna work or not, but I felt like it was worth trying because if you can make a stable formula based system, it frees you from that canoe mold and your build gets a lot faster, a lot easier, and a lot less expensive. It took me about 17 prototypes that first year to get it right, but ultimately we got a stable system. We released a video course. It ended up being really popular. And then after that, it's just been a matter of iterating on that system to see how many different sizes and shapes of canoes I could get it to build. And it's definitely not a perfect system. There's things that it will do and things that it won't do. But I think overall, I've been really surprised by the versatility and the scalability of the process here. And that's really the cool thing about working with a mathematically based system is that because you can scale it up or down and because these particular canoes don't need to have any permanent thwarts, it means that we can nest them together like Russian dolls, which is great for storage and also for transportation. Now, additionally, I've come up with a sailing rig for this that is super simple. It stows nice and tight out of the way, but then it pops up in the bow whenever you want to catch a favorable breeze. I have a catamaran system for these boats, which is really fun for rafting together and sailing downwind. It's also been a really fun way for me and my partner to run moving water rivers. And then finally this year, I released a rowing system for this, which is really easy to build, really fast to install, and mimics the rowing geometry of an Adirondack guidebook. So that's a roundup of the history here. Now let's start talking about this canoe, its design, and where the designs are headed in 2021. So my big design focus for 2021 is just gonna be to continue updating our full-size canoe designs. I already love the pack canoes I can build with this system, and I liked the solo canoes that I built last year, but this year I wanna to try to make those even better. I've only been designing canoes for about four years now, which means I still have a lot to learn about what makes a good full-size canoe shape and how to apply my system to that. But that wasn't actually the point of this particular boat here. The reason I built this canoe in the size that I built it is just because I needed a good medium-sized teaching tool that I could use to refilm the entire canoe building course to incorporate all of my own updates and all the feedback that I'm continually getting from students. So we just finished an entire course refilm here. The material looks great, production values are good, everything's really easy to understand and I got the opportunity to build a canoe that I wouldn't normally build here and to do a bunch of design experiments to hopefully push the system forward this year. So what I ended up building here was a little bit of a hybrid canoe. This boat is 13 foot nine inches long by 28 and a half inches wide. It's 10 and three quarter inches deep in the middle. It weighs 26 pounds with nothing in it and 30 pounds with the sail, the flotation and the seat installed. And I didn't go into this trying to make the perfect sized boat for any particular use because I already know what that is for me. I'm 5'8", 165 pounds, and personally I like a pack canoe that I use with a double bladed paddle to be 27 inches wide, 10 inches deep, and about 13 foot 5 inches long. And I like a full size solo single blade boat that you sit up on a seat to be 28 and a half inches wide by 12 inches deep by about 15 foot three inches long. And what I was curious about, because I was already just doing an experiment here, is what would happen if I blended those two boats together? And hybrid boats like this are always appealing because who doesn't want to have more versatility 
in a more compact package, but they're also risky because anytime you're trying to make something do too many things at the same time, you risk creating a boat that does no particular thing very well. So in a couple minutes, I'll actually talk about how that turned out and how it feels on the water and what I might do differently next time. But first, why don't we come in a little bit closer and I'll just talk about all of the new shaping and physical and construction details that I experimented with on this boat. So starting with the deck shape in plan view here, what I've been doing for the last couple years is building my solo canoes asymmetrically. So the widest point of the boat is about five inches aft of center, and that pushes more volume into the back of the boat. And the reason I've been doing that is just because my experience as a kayak designer tells me that that's gonna be a more efficient hull shape, and also it's gonna make the boat more controllable in challenging wind and wave conditions, especially when conditions are coming from the stern quarter. But the difference between how I do this on my kayaks and what I've been doing on the canoes is that the kayak asymmetry is dramatic, and this is actually pretty subtle. So I wanted to build this canoe completely symmetrical just to see if I could feel a difference between this and a similar boat that I built last year. And I feel like I can tell a slight difference in how quick it feels on the water, but this canoe is also flatter on the bottom, which means that that might be due to the wetted surface, or it just might be due to the wind that I was paddling in, or maybe even my imagination. So as far as what I'm gonna do from here, for the next couple canoes that I build, I'm probably gonna go back to asymmetry for my solo canoes, but I'm not sure I'm gonna stay there because plenty of popular solo canoes over the years were built completely symmetrically, and there's good arguments for going symmetrical as well. Let's say you're building a tandem canoe where you're gonna be sitting in the bow seat facing backwards when you're paddling it solo. In that case, you'd wanna go symmetrical. And if you're gonna drop a rowing frame into any of my canoes, I think that a symmetrical shape might make the handling a little bit better when you're using it in that mode. So that kind of brings me to the bottom shape in here. Let's come in a little bit closer and we'll talk about that. Unfortunately, I've got this flotation tied in place, so you can't really see the shape here, but I'll make sure I put in a slide so you can see what it looks like without this stuff in there. And the big rib experiment that I did on this boat was to push a bunch of extra volume into the formula to see how flat and how stable I could make one of these boats on the bottom here and whether that would create any problems with the system. And the good news is that it worked just fine. It had the intended result, but there are always trade-offs whenever you're changing the shape of a boat that much. The flatter you go, the more stable you're gonna be, but the slower the canoe is gonna be. So this is actually a lot flatter and more stable than I want for my own personal canoes because I like things to be nice and quick on the water, but it's nice because it shows me that if you want this kind of stability, you can get it using this system. So the seating arrangement for this boat ended up being kind of a happy accident. I wasn't originally planning on putting a normal canoe seat in this. I was just gonna sit about three inches off the bottom with a pad and paddle it with a kayak paddle and then make myself a removable kneeling thwart that clicked over the top of the gunnels for when I wanted to come up in a single blade mode. But as soon as I got in this with a kayak paddle, I realized that I had overshot the depth and the width of the boat just a little bit for my size frame to be comfortable that way. So I felt like I would at least try to salvage it and set it up the same way that I do with my solo single blade canoes by putting some blocks on the inside of the gunnels and mounting a seat. And normally in this case, I would go with a curved drop webbing seat because I find that to be more comfortable and it fits the geometry of my deeper solo canoes. But in this case, I didn't order one of those because I wasn't planning to use it. So I just grabbed this old flat cane seat from downstairs and put it in. And as soon as I put this in here, I realized I was onto something because even though this canoe is shallower, because the seat is flat, I'm still preserving eight inches of space to the top of the ribs here, which for someone my size is the perfect height for a kneeling thwart. But what I can also do because this is a flat seat and because these gunnels are straight, is put this up on top of the gunnels as well, which puts me in a good sitting position if I'm just gonna be sitting normally. And that ability to mount the seat underneath and on top of the gunnels is really a game changer for me for a whole bunch of different reasons. Like I just said, it's nice to not have to choose a compromise height between what I prefer for a kneeling thwart and what I prefer for my sitting position. It's also just nice to be able to quickly move the seat up and down in the canoe to adjust for different conditions. So if you're heading out in rough water, whether you're kneeling or whether you're sitting, you can put this nice and low for a bunch of extra stability. Or if it's a calm day or if the boat is loaded with gear, you can put it up high for a more comfortable all day long sitting position. But 
Admittedly, you could accomplish both of those same things even in my deeper solo canoes just by adding in some spacer blocks. But there's an additional advantage here that I didn't even think about until I took this out and started paddling it, and that is because it's shallower, it has slightly better paddling ergonomics. Now, if you've looked at some of the most popular solo canoes, you'll notice that they're all usually around 12 and a half inches deep, and most of them have significant shouldered tumble home right towards the top. And the reason for that, or at least one reason for that, is that having the boat be a little bit narrower means that it's going to keep water out in more extreme conditions. But the bigger reason is just that it's usually in a straight-sided canoe, only the last couple inches of the gunnel up towards the top, that really starts to interfere with your stroke and cause you to not be able to tuck in quite as tightly to the center line as you want. But if you really think about it, a shallow canoe like this is really mimicking the same paddling geometry as a deeper canoe with shouldered tumble home. This isn't a gigantic difference here, and if I had a reason to go for a deeper canoe, I would still go for a deeper canoe, but it's just kind of neat that it works that way, and it's something that I wouldn't have thought about. And all these things combined is really causing me to rethink how I think about shallow canoes in general. Up until now, I've considered all the canoes that I build between 9 and 11 inches deep to be purely pack canoes, where you're going to sit in the bottom and paddle with a double-bladed paddle because you need those low sides for comfortable elbow clearance. But after setting this up and actually paddling it this way, it really makes me wonder if this might not be a good way to build a solo single-blade canoe for someone who's going to be paddling in more protected waters. Now, obviously, if you're going to be out on big lakes where there's big wind and waves and chop, you don't want a canoe this shallow because you could end up getting swamped by the waves. But if you're not paddling in those conditions, setting your boat up this way gives you the advantages that I just talked about. It's also going to cut two pounds right off the top of the weight of your boat, and it's a little bit easier to bend the ribs with my rib shaping system if the boat is a little bit shallower. And one final advantage is that the shallower you go with my building system, the easier it is to get a super flat square bottom that's going to give you a ton of stability. And that's not necessarily an issue for me because I don't want my canoe to be that stable because I'm not willing to pay the speed penalty. But if you're someone who's going to be using a boat in calm waters, mostly for photography or fishing, this might be a really good way to set up your single blade canoe. Now, just a couple quick technical notes here for any of my students who happen to be watching this video. If you decide to set up your shallower canoe this way, there's a couple things you need to keep in mind. The first one is that I would never put a cane seat in any canoe because unless this material is synthetic and made by hand, these never last. You always want to go with a web seat. And then if you're thinking about nesting shallower canoes like this, you just have to keep in mind that the same nesting geometry applies as my larger canoes, meaning that they have to be two inches difference in width to accommodate for these seat blocks as opposed to the inch and a half difference that we use normally for our shallower pack canoes. And then finally, for my other solo single blade canoes where this is just going to be mounted beneath the gunnels, what I do is I install a T-nut into the bottom of the seat right here and drive the bolt right down into that just because it's a super quick way to get the seats in and out of the boat. But if you're going to be mounting above and below your gunnels, you can't do that. So in this case, what I'm using is just my normal bolts. And I'm using these small star knobs on the bottom, which I think are really convenient. But if you're willing to spend five minutes down there with a tiny wrench, you could also just do this with normal nuts and washers as well. Now, zooming out a little bit here, the shear curve that I chose for this boat is just the standard shear that I use for all my canoes. I feel like it's a good compromise between windage while still keeping the ends high enough to keep waves from coming in over the bow. It also looks nice. And for this particular canoe, I did something that I've only done in my larger canoes with recurving stems in the past. And that is, I've added some additional wedges to the top of the gunnels here just to sweep the ends up a little bit more. And it's arguable whether or not this has any functional utility, but the idea behind it at least is that in such a shallow canoe, a little bit of extra sweep towards the end here is going to keep green water from coming over the bow if you're heading into a really steep chop. I don't mind getting a little white water over the front of a canoe once in a while, but I really don't like actual waves to come into the boat here. So I will do this in the bow of this style of canoe in the future. I'm not going to do it in the stern though because it's just not necessary. Now, turning the boat upside down here, I'm having to get a little bit creative with the lighting right now because this canoe is so glossy on the bottom that if we light it from the outside, 
you can't see what's happening. So anyways, you can see the nice flat bottom shape that I was talking about earlier. Once again, this is a little flatter and a little more stable than I want for my own canoes, but it's nice to know that the system can make this shape if you want that. Now, for the rocker profile on this, I'm sitting somewhere around inch and a quarter, inch and a half from end to end, and that gives me a tracking to maneuverability balance to where when I'm paddling straight ahead, the boat is wagging just a little bit, and then when I want to turn, I can spin it 180 degrees with about two and a half sweep strokes. And whether I'm in a canoe or whether I'm in a kayak, that is the tracking maneuverability balance that I prefer personally. But if you're someone who wants more or less, you can always modify the rocker just depending on your preferences. Now, another experiment I did on this boat is instead of using the 3 8 or half inch wide brass half oval stem bands that I've done in the past, I decided to protect the end here with a thin strip of Delrin plastic. And the appeal of Delrin in this application is that it's a little bit easier to work with. It is a lot more abrasion resistant, which means that at least in theory, it should give us better protection around the ends. And it ends up being a heck of a lot lighter. Both of the stem bands for this canoe in plastic ended up being four ounces. Whereas if I had done that in brass, they would have been 12 ounces for three eighths and a pound and a quarter for half inch wide brass. So there's a pretty significant weight difference there. And if you're someone who's really into ultralight, this might be a good option. The only wild card with this is that because it is a new part of the system, I don't know for sure how it's gonna hold up over time. Myself and a bunch of the different boat builders that I know seem to think that this is gonna be fine, but if you're someone who doesn't like doing experimental things, you could always just go with the standard brass. Now, one more thing I wanna mention about this is that the reason I don't use UHMW in this application is because it has such a large thermal expansion coefficient that as soon as it gets warm, it bubbles up between the fasteners and debris gets trapped underneath there. And then ultimately with heating and cooling cycles, it ends up failing at the fastener locations. And high density polyethylene also has this problem, but it's not quite as bad, so you can work around it. But the reason I don't go with high density polyethylene, at least not usually, is because it needs to be at least a quarter inch tall to be stable in this application, which can affect the tracking of your canoe. Now, that might actually be a good thing. If your canoe is too loose, you could put on a taller rub strip and that'll tighten it up. But generally, I try to keep things as low profile as possible. Now, moving on here to all the things that are pretty much the same as they were in previous versions. Overall, the sail system works the same as it always has. It just tucks nice and tight off to the side here, but then you can pop it up really easy whenever you wanna catch a favorable breeze. It's not gonna give you crosswind performance at this size, but you can sail pretty quick on a broad reach or running straight down wind. I've changed the sail material for my own sail here from Dacron to Ripstop Nylon, just to make it a little bit lighter. And I've also put this on a carbon fiber mast, which is also really nice and light if you can swallow the cost of the carbon fiber. And I'm giving people both options in my plan sets now. And at the same time, I'm also working on creating a separate course just to show people how to make these sails for kayaks and canoes. Now for my flotation here, I'm still using those same solid four inch diameter pool noodles that I've used in the past. And this is not intended to be enough flotation so you can paddle a swamped canoe to safety. It's just enough flotation so you can turn a swamped boat on its side and it's naturally gonna dump out most of the water. It just makes all your normal rescues a little bit easier. And then just like in any canoe, if you need additional flotation, you can always lace that into the ends of the canoe. And the nice thing about a skin boat is all these ribs make those attachments even easier. And then to protect the bottom of the boat here, what I do in my canoes is I just put a Thermarest Ridge Rest mat, and I feel like that's pretty comfortable. It gives it a lot of protection, but it doesn't add a lot of weight. If you want to, you could put floorboards in here. I just don't think it's really necessary. Now, as far as the actual wood that the frame is built out of here, I'm still using white oak for the ribs because it's strong and rot resistant and it steam bends really well. And I would always recommend paying the extra money to get really high quality bending oak because nothing is more frustrating than fighting bad bending stock. Now, for the longitudinal members here, I used Port Orford Cedar for the keel, mostly just because I had it sitting around and I wanted it to be a little bit stronger. And then I used Red Cedar for the rest of the stringers and the gunnels just to keep the canoe nice and light. And if you have a full selection of wood available, you can choose any long clear softwood that you want here that has the strength to weight ratio that you want for how you're gonna use your canoe. But oftentimes you might not have that choice, in which case, 
any long clear soft wood is going to be just fine for these framing members. Now, as far as the skin that I'm using, I'm still going with that same 840 extra tough nylon that I get from skinboats.org. I really like this skin because it's reasonably lightweight, but it's also really strong and it shrinks super duper tight onto the boats. And for coating this, I saturated this with four layers of their two-part polyurethane. Sometimes I go less, sometimes I go more. It just depends on the durability I want for that particular boat. And the reason this is a dark color is because before I put the coating on, I painted this with fabric dye. And I don't usually put dark colored fabric dye onto my boats because it doesn't tend to look very good after a while with the ultraviolet radiation, but it does look pretty nice, at least when it's new here. All right, so that's all the details I can think to tell you about at this point here. Now, as far as how I feel about this boat as a concept, I already mentioned that for a dedicated solo single blade canoe for someone my size, I like to go a little bit longer. And for a dedicated pack canoe where I'm just gonna be using a kayak paddle, I like to sit lower and I like to go narrower. But as kind of a hybrid boat, I actually think this is a pretty fun, handy little size here. So for someone who just wants to toss a canoe in the back of their pickup and head out for a couple hours, do a little bit of fishing, paddle a few miles, and isn't concerned with getting the absolute best straight ahead paddling performance. This thing has a lot of positive attributes for surprisingly few negative attributes. And it's also just a really good first sized canoe to build here with my system. So oftentimes if somebody calls me up and they say they wanna build a tandem or a very large solo, I'll recommend that they build something more in the pack canoe size first just to get familiar with the system so they have better results on larger boats. But this experiment shows me here that at least for this particular size, a small solo single blade canoe is possible if you're willing to live with some compromises. So anyways, I think it's a cool boat. If I'm gonna build it again for myself, what I would probably do is come in about a half inch narrower and a quarter of an inch shallower for me. And I would make it asymmetrical just like the canoes that I built last year. So anyways, that is the first canoe for 2021 here. I'm really excited about the directions that I'm hoping to go this year. We've got a lot of really interesting things coming up here on the channel. Also, if you're interested in learning more about my system and seeing the experiences of other people building this way, check out our website and click where it says student builds. And on that page, you're gonna see a map of all the different student builds all over the world right now. And if you scroll down, you can choose all the different types of skin boats that I make and look at the blogs for people that are building these boats. And if you're someone who doesn't mind spending a little bit of time uploading a few pictures and some text of your build, that's a great way to save a little bit of money because we offer a discount for anyone who's willing to put up their build on our site. It's also just been a really cool way for paddlers all over the world to connect with each other and share building tips and material sources. So anyways, that's it for now. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, make sure you hit that like and subscribe button. You can also find me on my website, which is capefalconkayaks.com, where I've got a bunch more skin on frame building videos, plan sets, and various free resources. You can find us on Instagram at Cape Falcon Builds, where I post a daily build blog of everything I'm doing here in the shop, including all kinds of skin boat tips and tricks that you're not gonna see anywhere else except for inside of my paid courses. And even if you're not normally a social media person, I would really encourage you to check out the Instagram channel because YouTube videos like this are a lot more time consuming to make, which means that most of the stuff that I'm doing here doesn't actually make it onto the YouTube channel, but you can find that every day in Instagram. So anyways, thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. Have fun building your skin boat. Be safe while you're paddling.